bless you, God. Now give the Lord praise in this room this morning. Thank you, Lord. Bless you, God. Remain standing with me. I will we'll pray together. I'll get to some scriptures on the screen here in a moment. But I want to preach this morning and share my heart for a few minutes with the Lord's help. If they'll go ahead and put that on the screen, the title. You mean now, God? You mean now, God? That's what I want to preach about today. Lord, I pray that you would accomplish your purpose. We depend upon you and trust and rest in you, Lord. God, I pray that you would touch lives, Lord, really where it happens is one life at a time. God, I pray for you to do that for people today and that we would be yielded and respond to you. I pray for your anointing. God, I, I can't do anything under my own steam, under my own power. It takes you. God, I pray that you would do that today. Lord, your touch, your anointing, your presence makes all the difference in the world. And I pray for that today to come in power. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Give the Lord another praise. Thank you, Lord. And bless somebody as you're being seated this morning. Say it with me. You mean now, God? There are occasions when we wrestle with the timing of God that we do not understand why God does things the way He does or when He does things when He does or maybe sometimes even when he doesn't do things when or how we would like for him to we wrestle with that that his ways are above our ways and his thoughts above our thoughts And I have come to learn to be frankly honest probably the hard way that sometimes one of the chief ways in our lives that we wrestle one of the chief things we wrestle with and one of the chief ways that God does his work in our lives is coming to that point of being fully surrendered for God to do things his time and his way you know we pray and I tell people this quite often and we you know we act like we don't know if God's going to answer prayer or not or if he's good or not, or if he cares or not, or not. Sometimes we've spent 20 years digging ourselves into a hole, and then we're ready to backslide if he doesn't fix it all in a week. Go ahead. That's a good place to respond. And so, you know, God just doesn't always do things in the time and way. I have come to understand in the time and way that we would desire, I have come to understand that we tend to underestimate, we overestimate what can happen. Sometimes, a lot of times, we overestimate what will happen in five minutes but we underestimate what God can do in, in the next five years. Amen. You know, we, God, won't you do something in my marriage? Won't you do something in me? And again, if it, you know, if it doesn't all happen, life is not a TV show. Everything's not fixed in 30 minutes. And if it doesn't all happen immediately, we're ready to call God a liar. I want to tell you, God 
If I could figure him out, he wouldn't be God. I need somebody bigger than I am. And we wrestle with this thing because sometimes it seems like God will keep us waiting because he really is interested in what's best for us. And that's really what love is. I had somebody question me recently and take issue with me. They said, well, I guess, you know, I was trying to let them know that we loved them and they took issue saying that, well, I guess I just define love differently than most people do. And I thought, buddy, no, you define love exactly the way everybody else does because we think love is doing what I want, what will make me happy right now in this moment. You know what you get with that? You get rotten children whom you have spoiled. We think love is getting everything I want to make me happy and feel better right now. No, real love is not getting what you want right now. Real love is when somebody is committed to what's best for you, whether it makes you happy in the moment or not. And so sometimes it'll seem like we wait forever and then all of a sudden God says, get up, come on, this is it, we're moving. And we wrestle with that to come to terms with that and quite often we say, you mean now, God? Even in some things that we've been seeing God do, I spent some time with a pastor friend of mine this week over lunch who was sharing with me that they are experiencing a very similar move of God to what we have been seeing in about the last month and a half and much in the same time frame. And as I am beginning to hear reports, it's not just this house. God cares about us, but wherever people are hungry and will let him be God, God is ready to move. I said God is ready to move. Now it's not going to happen everywhere because everywhere doesn't want him. In fact, a big part of what we call the church is just going to go on with life as normal because we'd rather have our agenda and what we can figure out and what we can control. And some of us may have prayed for some things a long time and all of a sudden, sometimes even when it looks like at the most inopportune moment, God will step into the middle of things and say, I'm ready to make myself real in your life he'll move wherever people are hungry and attentive can I tell you there's not a formula we want 2 plus 2 equals 4 and God just doesn't operate that way can I tell you that in order to walk with God that it requires a fluidity it requires a fluidity God moves and God answers prayer, but he does it on his terms, at his time, by his power, for his glory. I said God will move, but he does it on his terms, at his time, by his power, and for his glory. Because he, he's not interested in just putting a Band-Aid on it, just making you feel better for the moment. He's interested in long-term, lasting change. See, there's a war going on in you. There is a fleshly part of you, and there is a spiritual part of you. Amen. There's a dichotomy. There's a fleshly part of you and there's a spiritual part of you and whichever one you feed the most is the one that's going to be the strongest. And we wonder why can't I see some good thing happen and it's probably because you've been feeding your flesh for years at every opportunity and starving your spirit man to death and then wonder why the devil is beating your brains out. And we may wait long, but then God will come. Can I tell you, God has come to you, to us, right now. Right now. He'll meet you now. Not someday. This day. 
This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. He'll come to meet you right here, right now. You mean now, God? I've been fighting this mess for 30 years. Yeah, he's come right now to meet you here. Now, there are some scriptures that teach us that in Joshua chapter 3. Somebody say, you mean now, God? We've been talking about this in Joshua 3. Beginning at verse 14, this is when they're going into the promised land. So it was when the people set out from their camp to cross over the Jordan with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people. And as those who bore the Ark came to the Jordan and the feet of the priests who bore the Ark dipped in the edge of the water, for the Jordan overflows all its banks during the whole time of harvest, that the waters which came down from upstream stood still and rose in a heap very far away at Adam. Here's what's going on here. They had been, are y'all with me? They had been in Egyptian bondage for 400 years, thereabouts. God brings them out. There are 10 plagues that fall on Egypt and he parts the waters of the Red Sea and brings them out. And then because of their rebellion, unbelief, and disobedience, they spend 40 years in the wilderness. And then after 40 years and a generation has passed away, word comes down, we're going into the promised land in three days. <laughs> you mean now, God? You mean now? They've waited 40 years, and now he says they're going into the promised land in three days. Get yourselves ready. Prepare yourself. We're going into the promised land. I'm ready to do something now. And after they've waited all these years, when they go into the promised land, they've got to cross over the Jordan, and just like he'd parted the Red Sea, he would part the Jordan. But they've waited 40 years, and then when he decides it's time for them to go into the promised land, it's a, the, the river is at flood stage. It's at flood stage of all times. You mean now, God? You mean now? I've fought this insecurity all my life. I've fought this addiction for years. The devil says, I've had this bitterness, this resentment, this unfair. The devil says, you've always been this way. You'll never change. But all of a sudden, God shows up. And we say, you mean now, God, at flood stage, when it seems like it's worse? Yeah, God wants to save your family now. And God wants to change you now. And God wants to set you free now. Look over at somebody and testify now. <clears throat> he come right now. Right now. When it seems like, <clears throat> of all times, why now? When it seems like things are at flood stage. Can I tell you this? As God is beginning to move in some different places, we'd say, why now? Lord, we've prayed for a long time and now there, there is the, the evil in this world is at flood stage. There is a release. There, in, the, in the last bit, there has been a release of the spirit of Antichrist on the earth the likes of which you and I have never witnessed during our lifetime. We're seeing the rise of an antichrist spirit. It's not just they don't agree with us, they hate us. There's a venom, there's a vitriol, there's something there. It's an antichrist spirit that we've never seen before. But when evil is at flood stage, God said where sin abounds, grace did much more abound. And there's a rising tide as God is beginning. Can I give you a prophecy? As far as the world condition, it's not going to get any better. The light is going to get brighter and the darkness is going to get darker. And while there's a flood tide of evil rising in ways that none of us have ever seen during our lifetime, at the same moment, God is beginning to pour His Spirit out. 
on the hungry, on the thirsty, on dry ground, on people who want to do more than just go through the motions on Sunday morning, on people who are looking for God to move. Somebody praise him. <clears throat> you mean now, God? Yeah, now. While the evil is getting worse, that he pours out. The word said that said when grace abounds, when sin abounds, grace would much more abound. The word said that when the enemy comes in like a flood, that God would raise up a standard against him. Amen. At the same time, are y'all hearing me? We act like there's so much evil going on that how could God move in the midst of that? I want to tell you, God is not intimidated by evil. God has never backed down from a fair fight or from a fight. The devil doesn't fight fair, but God, God's not intimidated by a fight. Elijah stood on Mount Carmel and 450 prophets had cried out all day long and Elijah made fun of them and said maybe your God has gone to the bathroom and is indisposed at the moment and not able to move for you and Elijah stood up and prayed a 63 word prayer and fire fell from heaven right in the midst of the worst evil God unleashes the flood tide of his spirit You mean now, when my life's comfortable, when I've got things the way I want them, when I can just do the nice little church thing and get by, you mean God is calling me to something more, to a place of service and sacrifice? See, there was a time, the generation that fought World War II, they prized service and sacrifice our generation prizes self fulfillment and self expression and it's all about me <coughs> and God says now now right in the middle of the flood of evil at the same time it won't inhibit me a bit I will pour out my glory There's another example in Matthew 2. Jesus, the Bible said, in the fullness of time, the book of Galatians, in the fullness of time, God for, sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, that he might redeem those who are under the law. Now, at this point, they've been through the events of the Christmas story that we're familiar with. The shepherds in the field and the baby in the manger. And many scholars believe, because they were in their own house apparently by that time, that Jesus may have been two, two or three years old when the wise men showed up. And they come and they present their gifts of gold. Are y'all still with me? Of gold and frankincense and myrrh. It looked like they were finally starting to do better. These were poor people. They'd been so poor, they had to, how would you like to lay your newborn? We want them in a hospital, in a sanitized environment. How would you like to lay your newborn? You don't have any more of the wealth of this world than to have to lay your newborn baby in a feeding trough with animals around. It's not a sanitary environment, but they followed the Lord. And now they're in their own house and three kings, at least three, Maybe very well more than that. But there were three gifts. They bring in their treasure chest. I mean, they're finally doing good. When the angel of the Lord says, Herod's after the baby. Come on, is anybody hearing me? You get up and you take your family to Egypt, Joseph. And you protect destiny. 
and you protect the promise of God. And it would have been easy for Joseph to say, you mean now, God? You mean now, God? I have a pastor friend who pastors in Lexington. He'd been a faithful layman in his church for years. He was a painter. He's a professional artist. One of the few that actually didn't have to wait until he died for his paintings to become famous. And he'll tell you that. And he grew very, he, 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 I mean, God prospered him. He was blessed financially. His name is Mitchell Toll. But God told Mitchell Toll there was a church in Lexington that was about to go under. Mitch had never pastored in his life. And God said he'd just been a layman in his church. He said, Mitch, I want you to go pastor that church. And I've heard Mitch tell the story. I'm paraphrasing a bit, but basically he said, you mean now, God? Life was easier not to do that. Corporations flew him in to speak to their people. His life would have been much easier materially not to respond to the call of God. But he took that church and God is blessed and they're touching that city and he's pastoring about 500 people in Lexington today and they're experiencing the touch and the move of God but it's because God, somebody responded when God said you get up and go now <coughs> you mean now God and Joseph and Mary responded with a quick obedience a willingness could it be in this hour that God speaks? It may look like the, right, the wrong time, but I have to take one step forward and trust God even though I cannot see how it will all come to pass. <clears throat> but he gives us a promise in Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 19. Behold, God said, Behold, I will do a new thing. When? Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a, a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Can I tell you what I really believe? I wanted for years to be able to preach this kind of message, and God wouldn't let me, and that's the truth. And I'm not saying everything always looks the way we thought it would look. But I'm telling you, we are at a crew, a, not, not just our church, in the body, of Christ, the body of Christ, we are at a crucial moment. We are at a critical time. And we want to look back and say, you mean now, God? Listen, we want to make a difference wherever we can. But it's not just about if we could get the right governor or if we could get the right president elected. This is about God doing something in people's lives one life at a time. We're still, we want to talk about church growth. We don't talk about people getting saved anymore. I said we don't talk about people getting saved anymore. This is a now moment. It's time for you to get up, shake off yesterday, quit making excuses saying you mean now, God, and get all in to the flow of what God is doing. <clears throat> he said, I'm doing a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. You see, here's what has to happen. I have to synchronize my heart to kingdom time God wants to deliver you from your addiction now change your life now touch your family now do a work in you now set you free now put you in the harvest field where you get your eyes off yourself and helping somebody else and he wants to do it now he wants to touch young people now he wants to pour his spirit out now but we have 
have to synchronize. I've watched too many cop shows. 70s and 80s cop shows that I love and my family makes fun of. And uh, quite often there comes a moment where they say, let's synchronize our watches. You remember that? There's a definition, synchronize. Synchronize means to cause to indicate the same time as one time piece. I should have had peace there, one time piece with another. To cause to go on, move, operate, work with, etc. at the same rate and exactly together. Now God will synchronize his people. But we have to synchronize with heaven. Because there are things when we look around, we think, this is the wrong time. Pastor, there's a drug epidemic. In case you hadn't noticed. What do you mean revival? Two weeks from today, we're doing a recovery Sunday. We'll have a man in to share his testimony. We try to do it all the time. But there'll be agencies here from all over the region. We are throwing the doors open for every person in recovery, every person trying to come out of addiction in the Tri-County and saying, you are welcome here. We want you here. We will break the stigma and Jesus will set you free. And now is the time. This isn't just for church people. There's a world dying without God. <clears throat> but we look and we say it's not the time. I, I heard statistics this week that tell us that now the average age for kids to start experimenting with drugs is 11. I also heard statistics that said that in this region of Kentucky the level of drug usage for homes and families is one in three that every one in three house there's drugs there every one in three families there's drugs there somewhere You mean now, God? Do we believe his word or not? The last month and a half, we've shouted and danced. I have laid hands on everything that moved and some that didn't. And we have shouted all over this place and we believe in it. But it's not just for us to have Holy Ghost goosebumps. It's because God wants to put that power in a harvest to turn a world upside down, to change things for his glory. And all we can pray about is our personal slice of pain. We don't ever pray for the harvest. We don't ever pray for those that are lost without God, for kids that the only time they get a meals at school and the only time they hear God's name used is in a curse word. Because all I'm concerned about is me. <clears throat> Somehow we've got to synchronize with heaven. Because here's what happens. When I... The Bible said... Are y'all with me? He said, I want to do a new thing now. Jesus said, pray this way. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Is that what he said? He was calling us to synchronize our watches and our lives with heaven. To get on heaven's time. You look around and say, well, this is a terrible time. I don't know how God could do anything in my family now. What's, what's going on in heaven? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I'm trying to synchronize with there. In other words, when I synchronize that what I'm doing here 
has to line up with what's going on there because that's the realm of reality. Are you hearing me? <clears throat> Some of you will remember a few months back we had Pastor Tomic from Poland here with us, did a healing service. Great guy, great man of God. And Pastor Tomic asked me a long time ago to do some mentoring with him because you have to understand all they've ever seen is Catholicism they don't have any model for anything when it comes to doing ministry before they left that day I'd almost forgotten we were going to try to take them out to eat to go to the KFC because that's a big deal we always take the missionaries to KFC because that's a big deal seriously it really is and uh, but before they left I'd forgotten, and I should have remembered because I'd been around those guys. He said, can we go through the building? They wanted to see our building because they have no model. They've got these big cathedrals. You come in for 30 minutes, you're out. There's not even, I mean, there's silver and gold, and literally in these cathedrals, there's not even bathrooms in there because they don't plan on staying that long. They have no model for church. And so he asked me to do some mentoring with him. So once a month, and we talk about a variety of ministry issues and walking with God and family and all that stuff. And, but once a month we get on WeChat. They don't... Anyway, whole other story there. But we get on WeChat and we'll spend an hour on the phone. Now, when we set our time in Poland, they are exactly six hours ahead of us so when I come into the office and Kathy knows I'll, I'll close the door I'll tell her I'm going to be on the phone for an hour 9 o'clock here I've just fairly early got into the office 9 o'clock here and it's 3 o'clock there because they're 6 hours ahead of us he's a school teacher and by that time he's got two young daughters and by that time, he's gotten out of school. And just recently, he said, Pastor Mark, we're pushing this a little bit. I appreciate you spending time with me. But I need to pick up my girls. Can we push this? It'd be 9 o'clock my time. Can we push it to 9.15 and be 3.15 my time to give me time to get my girls and get somewhere that I can talk? And I, sure, I said, sure, Tom. We say Thomas. They say Tomic. I said, sure, Tomic, that's fine. But push it. Can we push it 15 minutes so I can get my girls from school? I'm just starting my day. He's picking his girls up from school after he's taught that day. And I said, sure, that's fine. We can make that adjustment, not a problem. But what I was doing was I was adjusting what I did here based on what was going on there. The Bible said we walk by faith and not by sight. We're walking around in despair because this is what I see here. Just because it's what I see here doesn't mean that's what's going on there. There's a reality. My kids aren't getting any better. It just looks like they're getting worse. You're living by what you see here. What about what's happening in heaven? God may have dispatched the Holy Spirit to say, go work on them. It's time to bring them in. So we're saying, you mean now, God? And God's saying, yeah, now. You may have fought with some things for years, but now. Because when you synchronize, you adjust what you're doing here as you perceive what's going on there in the presence of God, which is the realm of reality. I'm almost done. I don't care what the doctor's report looks like here. What's the report in heaven saying? 
whose report will you believe? We shall believe the report of the Lord. I'm struggling. I'm fighting just because that's what I see here doesn't mean that's what's going on there. See, this is a crucial time. And to obey God is simply to be with Him in the now thing that He is doing. There is a release taking place for individuals, for regions, for the church as a whole. Yes, God means now. We say, God, why now of all times? The media hates us. They make fun of us. It seems like we're totally out of step with the world. Evil is rising. And God says right in the middle of that, I'm going to pour out my spirit. There is a spiritual acceleration. He is putting the pedal to the metal. We have to jump into agreement with God because, yes, he means now. I told you recently, and I don't know how he will lead long term. We'll see. But there are some adjustments that I felt the need to make in my personal life. Whether that was warfare or just coming into alignment with the promises of God or some of both. Because I sensed something. And I'm not trying to earn anything. And you can't make anything happen. I know I've spent years trying to. Wearing myself and everybody else out. But when when God was saying wait, I didn't want to run off. You know, doing my own thing. But after years of waiting, you think nothing's ever going to happen. Because when it, things shift in the spirit, and he says, all right now. I didn't want to miss it when I was waiting, but I don't want to miss it when it's time to move either. Because you can miss him in either direction. <coughs> I'm telling you, this is a now moment for us to embrace and whatever you need to do to get up out of your lethargy get up out of your apathy do something different than you've been doing and move toward him in a way that is serious and communicates that he says, if you'll draw near to me, I'll draw near to you. It's the way it works. He's not going to come if you don't want him. Stand with me.